Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to the studio. I'm Jessica Putnam Phillips, and today on ClayShare Live, we are gonna be making holiday dishes. Oh, that's right, holiday dishes, because it's the holiday season. I've been waiting, you know, for me, I start getting in the holiday spirit a few weeks before most people, but I know there's a lot of folks out there who are like, not till Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's done, it's over, it's straight on. For the holidays all the holidays are happening hanukkah's happening now everything's happening so it's holiday dishes night anyhow um, i'm going to be using sam bao underglaze decals because they did a really great lineup this year of underglaze decals that i love so we use some of these in my private broadcast for premium members we did some stuff that's why that's why some is missing right but um, we're gonna use some of these. We're gonna use some others. We're also gonna be using some of DaylawDesignGifts.com's cutters. This is the biggest cookie cutter ever. I mean, you could buy these cutters and make a cookie out of it first, like a big giant chocolate chip cookie, maybe, um, and then go to the studio with it. I wouldn't take it back to the kitchen after, but beforehand, oh, maybe you wanna make a Christmas tree cookie. I do. Uh-huh, so you can get these from DaylawDesignGifts.com. And I've got some GR Pottery forms we'll be using. Now the great thing about De La Design Gifts is Debbie Dela Cruz, who owns that company, she works with Jeff at GR Pottery Forms and designs her cutters to fit perfectly with a bunch of his forms. So when you are on her site shopping and looking at cutters, it says what forms they fit, which is really great. So that way you don't have to play a guessing game. So this big one here, works with his big platter, the 13 by 17 inch platter, this works with, and then this one works with the Christmas tree. So, oh, you wanna see a Christmas tree dish, I guess. There's one. So these haven't been glazed yet. They actually are still green. They just dried, because I made them last week. They have to go in the kiln and get bis fired and glazed, but that's a whole nother thing. We'll talk about glazing too, but, um, and if you don't have the underglazed decals you could use a rolling pin here's my snowflake rolling pin on a little tree and i made this one without the cutter sorry debbie um, so if you just have this tree form from gr pottery forms i just used the form itself as my template and then flipped it over onto it and i did a little video a few weeks ago you can find that in the clay share instagram or facebook um, account all righty everybody we're gonna work on some stuff let's start with the big stuff first and I did do a quickie video that I put up showing how I made this platter. So we're gonna make the platter, then we're gonna make the tree. And they actually go really, really fast. So if you're thinking you can't do this because you don't have time, well, it doesn't take that long to make them. Hi, everybody tuning in so I can see everybody's comments. So use the tree cutter with the GR form last night. Yay! So this is the reindeer platter. And there's the back. I do a double foot ring, and I'll show you how we make that. I did do it super fast. Maybe you saw that, and you're like, ah, I don't need a slow tutorial. I got the fast one. Okay, use the fat one, fast one. <laughs> I'm going to put this over here out of the way and get a new slab. Maybe I'll just get a new board. This one's looking pretty beat up. It's like magic. Slabs everywhere. So there's a lot of companies making underclays decals out there. Uh, Sam Bao and I have been working together for a few years. And I, I just, I love Dan. And that's, you know, Dan Lee from Sam Bao. He's just great. So, you know, because I have such a good relationship, I just always work with him. But I'm not opposed to other companies out there. So if you use somebody else's, you do what you like. All right, I'm just making sure I have enough clay. And this was from a slab I rolled out, whoops, this afternoon, usually around lunchtime, but I covered it with plastic, as you saw, so that it wouldn't dry out on me. I just wrap it both sides in plastic. You can't see anything that big stay flat for you. I've got some t little tips I'll share with you on keeping things flat. All right, rolled out my slab, uh, three eighths of an inch to a quarter of an inch thick, you know, when I scale up to big things like platters, I don't want them to be really skinny little things. I really want them 
to be substantial because you're more prone to warping when they're really thin. So the thicker they are, sometimes it's a little better. And because I rolled out on a piece of canvas, we're going to smooth this down. My apron, oh, I do have to give another shout out to Charlie Savat from PlayInTheMudDesigns.com who made me my cute little apron for the holidays. It says, have a merry clay share Christmas on it, which I'm certainly going to have. Hope you all do too. All right, so we're going to use underglaze decals on wet clay. And I've done many tutorials and classes, and you'll see me use them on leather hard clay, bone dry clay, bisque ware, whatever, you can put them on. And I do have wheel throwing tutorials where you put them on freshly thrown pieces on the wheel. So if you are a wheel thrower and you're like, yeah, that's great, but I don't hand build, got you covered. You can check those tutorials out. But even hand builders can get a lot from those tutorials because I show how to apply it to a damp surface. And that's what we're basically going to do tonight. All right, so I've got both sides smoothed and ready. Folks, I'm going to adjust the camera here for the, the Instagram folks so they get a better view. I'm glad you guys love the apron. You could check with Charlie and see if she's got any others. I don't know. All right, so we went through these a uh, few weeks ago when I first got them. The deer one I already used for a platter, so I'm not going to use it again. I'm going to save this and maybe make a Christmas tree dish out of it or a mug. A little deer mug would be really, really cute. I've got some penguins that are cute. This would make a cute platter, but I have to think about, you know, what I'm going to use it for and my personal style. This, and we were talking about decals that have a lot of color. Why not use this? This has a lot of color. Let's use this. They can be the hardest ones to transfer. So this one is like a sweater pattern and it, it can, can be a little difficult. So we'll do, the, we'll do the hard one together. Let me just show you what else I've got. This is a nice one. It's got a whole bunch of Christmas trees on it. And so you could cut these out individually and use them on mugs or little plates, or you could do a little forest or something. You can also make Christmas ornaments with this one. And I think that's what I'm going to do. That's my plan. Um, what else do we have? For those who haven't seen them yet, and you can go to Sam Bao's website. Uh, yeah, I've used this. This is these funny little Santas. Aren't they cute? Your husband, husband says, spread the wealth. Yeah, get your decals from wherever. You know, if you ha not everybody has the same designs, right? Ooh, and then the holly. Oh, I don't know everyone. I do have a Christmas dish in the holly, but this is very tempting. How classic and timeless is the holly for a platter? So I, get, I guess what we'll do is this. You can choose. We, I'll use, I will use this if I don't use it on the big platter. I will use it on the Christmas tree dish, but you guys choose. Is it gonna be the sweater decal or the holly decal? The sweater decal was hard to get. They're out every time you tried to get one and it's too late to get one now, oh no. And I've got a hole in mine. I don't know what happened down there. You ordered six textured pins on Monday, Woohoo! I know, we did open up um, you love the holly. Think about what it's going to be. It's going to be a big platter. Okay, holly wins. It's going to be a big, I mean, here's the rim of it. It's going to be a big platter. And if you look, you can see we got some overhang. We're going to deal with that. We're going to cut off this excess and we're going to use that. Well, actually, let's just cut it off right now so that I don't have to worry about it. We're going to cut off the corners and put them to the side. And that way I have some left so if you get one big sheet, you can make one platter with it, right? But I cut off this excess because you'll notice the top and bottom. There's a little, there's a little bit of empty space. And so we'll use this bit to fill it in, kind of like a collage, right? We'll kind of collage it in. So just trim those out. Okay. So we're ready, just making sure I've got my orientation. It's going to go like that. This is going to go right on top of it. So I'm going to lift that up. 
and let's drape our underglaze decal. Don't panic. You got a minute or two before it starts to transfer. Just get it lined up. You can even double check. Yes, yes, yes. We're good. Okay, so once you get it on, I like to start from the center and just kind of smooth it outwards. And if you have a yellow rib or any rib of choice, use that to smooth it out. It gets rid of the wrinkles really easy. Instead of using, you know, your hands. So it's already going to start transferring. You're going to see the color start to change on the underglaze decal. You're going to see it go from lighter to a more in like rich color. So I'm cutting off down here because this is empty. There's nothing here. It's just empty underglaze decal, right? But we need to put something there because we have this, right? So we got to fill in this space right here. So let's take what we have left over. So I'm just going to cut these out. It looks like that'll be a good one to go in here. And just put it there. Let's keep going. We got more because I don't want the empty space. Now, these designs, because they're non-directional, it's really easy to work with. That sweater one, what we would have had to do is do a border. And that would have been fine too. But you might not have liked, like, you might not like that, right? But this is going to be great. Got to fill in that spot over there. Are you guys seeing this okay? Your sweater has a hole in it. I'm going to cut around the hole. Yeah, I think, Jody, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it for the Christmas tree. And that section there won't be the one I use. But I wonder why our, we have holes in, our, holes in our sweaters. Are there decal moths? So when you're trying to figure out which side's up, if you look, you'll see one color is more vibrant. One side is more vibrant, and the other side's duller. And that's how you can tell. And actually, I'm going to pull this up. So this takes a little bit of time to do, but, you know, the end result, you're going to get this really beautiful, elegant, classic platter. Put this one. Where else do we need to put some? One there. See how dark this already has gotten? I haven't done anything at all to it. I'm just filling in, right? So while I'm doing that and chatting with you all, the decal is doing all the work. Need to put something over here. And that'll be that. And I think that'll do it. Okay. So you can see right here, I don't know if the camera is picking it up, but there's a little cloudiness, so that's because it hasn't transferred yet. And you can speed it along with a clean, damp sponge and just pounce it on there, and that'll help it transfer the rest of the way. And these here will take a little longer to do their transfer. Hey, Diane. Yeah, thanks, folks. I see a lot, a lot of people asking how I'm feeling. I'm feeling better. Yeah. I was under the weather for about uh, a little over a week and a half. But I turned the corner this morning when I woke up. I felt better. I knew, it, I knew things were going to be on, on an upward swing. So I'm taking a clean, damp sponge, and I'm just going to lightly brush it on the surface. But once I do this, I'm not going to go back in and use the rib again because the dampness could make the ink, the underglaze, too liquid. And if we do this, you'll smear it. Have, some of you might have done this, right? All the folks on, I love it, all the folks on YouTube wanted the sweater. All the folks on Facebook wanted the holly. Uh, what did the folks on Clayshare want? And I don't know what the folks on Instagram wanted. But that's so interesting. We will use the sweater next, okay, everybody? Everybody's going to get their way. 
But I like to think about what this is going to become. It's going to be a platter for serving uh, Christmas dinner on. And the sweater, a sweater could be fun for like cookies. It's casual. I guess it depends, right? If you're just going to have a fun, what if you're going to have an ugly sweater party? Do people still do those? All right, so I've pounced this on. And I do want to go back, and although it takes time, you want to make sure every one, the color is completely saturated. Because if not, when you peel it, you're going to have spots that are faded. And, and, and that can be okay. When I use it on bisque wear, um, I know it gives it more of a vintage look, but that might not be what you want. You might want a crisp, clean, rich transfer, which is what I want. I think good to go here. Okay, let's do a sneak peek. So, when the footing can you go over some tips to make them flat? Yeah, I can. We can. Some trays have lumpy feet. <laughs> Is there a big pizza decal? Oh, I don't know. I don't. I don't have one, but that would be cool, wouldn't it? All right, let's take a peek. See how we're doing. Did we transfer enough? See how that one's a little faded right there? It's not quite. Not quite yet. So. Hmm. Oh, I see. So when we pull it up, see that's a little faded right there. It's not not quite as rich. See some of the underglaze is still there. So if you're brave, you can very gently use this. But if you squeegee too hard, what happens is you saw how kind of juicy it was underneath there. That that ink is liquid. It's starting to transfer off the paper. And if you squeegee too hard, you'll smear it. And so you might have done that. I've done that in the past myself. The other thing you can do is if you peel it and you have one or two that are a little faded, you can go in with underglaze and paint and fix it. Speedball underglazes match sand bow colors perfectly. I would use their pine green and their red to match these colors here. All right, we're going to see. We'll just pounce that one a little more. I'm going to go with it. So some of them are a little more faded than I'd like. But I think we're just going to go. Normally I would let this sit a little longer, but we don't really have the time tonight. Don't rush your underglaze decals. There's no like race to get them on and off. You can let them sit on for 10, 15 minutes if they have to, to transfer the, the underglaze. I'm just grabbing an edge and peeling up. And I'm trying not to scrape the clay, but if you do, you can just take your finger and go in and smooth that out. Okay. Now, because we use this on wet clay, they're, they're a little tacky, and you have two choices. You can let them sit for a while and the clay stiffen up before you drape it over your form, but while you're waiting for that to happen, your clay is drying, and then it's going to be harder to get it to fit the form without cracking. Or you can go ahead and get yourself some cornstarch, like I have right here, and put that on. So you're having cracking issues on big pieces no matter what. Not necessarily decal, but just big pieces in general. So a lot of times cracking you know, can happen at any point. If you dry it too fast, especially big pieces, they, will, they can warp and crack under the strain. The other thing is when you fire them, you, know, you make sure the shelves you're using are nice and flat. Make sure you're not spanning a platter or a big piece across two shelves. That can cause cracking. And then the other thing I tell people is you want that piece to be able to move while it's firing. You know, it's going to expand and contract during the process. And if that piece stays stuck, what's going to happen is it's going to try to expand and contract on you. And it's going to crack because that's going to be the 
like easy way out for it. So I usually put a little bit of alumina hydrate on my kiln shelf. You could use kiln wash, dry kiln, kiln wash. You can also use some grog, like fine or medium grit grog. All right, so we brush that on there. And we're going to go here. And then I'm just going to cut this. How long can you keep decals for? Um, Kevin t uh, wrote an answer, but Sambau says six months. They have a shelf life of about six months, but I have some that I've had for a few years. I've kept them sealed up in Ziploc bags out of sunlight, and they're still good. That's the key is keeping them sealed up. Air dries them out, starts to degrade them. So made the big, made the big cut. The overhead camera is uh, I'm too close, and I'm too, sh I'm too, sh I'm vertically challenged. Let's see if I can. Uh, woo. Ooh. Look at that! I did it. I did it. That was a tough. That was tough for me, but I reached up and got it for you guys. All right. So now we pull off our cookie cutter. Now we go bake some chocolate chip cookies with that. That would be nice. Remote control zoom. Yeah. Okay. You put that on your list, Mr. Phillips. <laughs> All right. So we have our slab ready to go. And then I'm going to grab my Jarrah Pottery Form 13 inch by 17 inch. And we're just going to put this on here in the center. And I'm going to turn it and look at it from above just to make sure it's centered on there. You have to look at it from all four sides. And it, sometimes I'll get a ruler and I'll actually measure the distance from one edge to the other. That's a little crazy, but I mean, if you really want it to match and be perfectly aligned, how else are you going to do it if you don't measure? Okay, so that looks good. Now we're going to flip it. And I have another board here. We'll use the not so awesome board from you earlier. This is one I've had for ages. And so it's kind of reaching the end of its life. Maybe Sansa will bring Kevin that remote controlled camera. Uh, probably not. <laughs> Can you add underglaze after you corn starch the decal? I will add underglaze after it's been bisque fired. The cornstarch can kind of cause it to, it gets into the mix, right? If you were going to brush underglaze onto it. All right, so as I'm going to lift this up, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. My hands under here are just reaching in and I'm grabbing the edge and make, making sure it's folding down and kind of holding it in place so that as I peel this off, I don't actually peel up my slab. These big boards like this, they try to stick. And you don't want all the work you've just done lining it up nice and even all the way around to be in vain. All right, now we're just going to smooth everything out with a rib. I'm use a red, use a yellow, whatever. You could just use your sponge. And then I'm just going to take this down the side. Don't put too much pressure on this point where the bottom meets the edge. If you do, what happens is you get cracking because you actually thin it and compress it a little too much. So don't, little tip, don't do that and you'll be happier. So now I am going to move to my sponge. This is just a cheap pottery sponge. If you're using a groggy clay, you might want to use a, uh, one of the white Melamine sponges? Uh, where's mine? I have one somewhere floating around here. Um, like a, like a uh, magic eraser. Or if you get the yellow sponge from Cheryl Mud Tools, the, uh, they have the white sponge and a blue sponge. And I don't know, they have a couple colors. And it lists on their site what they're good for. All right, so now we're going to make feet because we need feet. So with large plates, do I kiln wash the shelves for bisque or glaze fire? So my kiln shelves are, bisque, are, are kiln washed always. 
with a liquid kiln wash that I apply to the shelves. And then when I'm bisque firing them, I do put a coat of the dry kiln wash or alumina hydrate down. All right, so we're gonna make our feet from the scrap that we have. I'm just gonna sit this to the side while we cut our feet. If you put your underglaze transfers on a piece of cardboard and vacuum seal them, they'll last a long time. Ooh, <coughs> good to know. You're vertically and horizontally challenged. <laughs> Too many to list. Um, what clay am I using? This is Laguna B-Mix 5. You could use any clay. <coughs> I'm still getting over that cold, though. So my voice is usually one of the things that goes on me when I'm sick. Hopefully it'll last. The magic sponge name for magic eraser. Ke Kevin's going to type that in. I'm going to drink more water. Thanks. It's melamine. Okay. <coughs> Hopefully my cough goes away. He's like, oh, when you're sick, do a broadcast. Good idea. <laughs> so I'm using a foot maker. Let's start over here. <clears throat> That'll be my inner foot. I might need a cough drop, Kev. You might have to go grab me one out of the house. Uh, Thanks. Okay. So hopefully my voice will last. It had been doing okay. I hadn't been talking too much, so it hadn't been much of a problem, but we'll see. So I'm just going to keep cutting little strips out. And if you have a really long piece of clay, you can go ahead and make, you know, one really long foot strip. But I've got all these little scraps that need to get used up anyways. And they have underglazed decal on the back, so not really going to reclaim them unless I'm going to use them for mold making or something. So this is a great way to use them up. And I do use alumina hydrate for bisque and for glaze, yeah. For the big pieces, because they still have to expand and contract. That's still happening during a bisque fire. Bisque fires go, you know, to like 1890 is about what I, Fahrenheit is about what I bisque fire to. So, you know, it, it gets hot. That's, that's hot. So I use it for all of that. So the rest of this clay, I will wedge up, dip in water. You know, I'll just bun bundle it up like this, dip it in my work water and let it set and then wedge it really well. And then I have a bag of reclaimed clay that's just for making molds, sprigs, stamps and such. And that's what I use this for. If you're going to do colored clay, you could also use it for that. If you're using a dark clay. But, you know, once you use an underglaze decal or underglaze transfer and you have that underglaze on it, it's going to tint it. It's not the end of the world, but it just happens. Just something to keep in mind, right? Okay, let's see if we got enough because I might have to cut some more up. We should be good. Yeah, so I just, what do I, it's a good question. What do I do with the clay with the underglaze on it? Yeah, I use it to make molds. See, we're good enough. Plenty, plenty. And then this will be the baby foot ring on the inside right here and that'll go something like this now this is all going to be very organic because we're doing this freehand I'm, I don't have a, a template or anything all right so now I know they're going to fit no problem I'm going to grab our slip and our serrated rib So do you need to wear a mask when applying the powder dry kiln wash? Is it safe? So uh, when I put it on, I just put a little bit on and I'm not like rubbing and spreading it around and it only is 
a very brief second of exposure to it. So I don't wear a mask usually, but yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to wear a mask. If you're concerned, if you ever have any doubts, if you're ever worried, put your mask on. It takes no time to put your mask on and then you don't have to worry about it. Same thing when you finish firing and you need to take it out. I have a little container. It's an old peanut butter jar. So save your peanut butter jars, folks, because you can brush your old kiln wash, dry kiln wash or alumina hydrate that you want to save to put on the shelf next time. And you can use that over and over again. So if you're concerned, you can wear a mask. I, you know, it's a very, for me, it's very quick. You're not exposed to it very long. So usually I don't wear a mask, but if you are concerned, by all means, please do wear a mask. All right, so we're gonna slip and score with this serrated rib on our edge. So that video I put up, I made one of these in three minutes. Um, <clears throat> it takes a little longer. <laughs> Oh, Bettina, you're very sweet. It doesn't take long at all. <laughs> it's, believe me, I can I get ready pretty quickly. <laughs> I get it down. So I'm going to put my first piece down and smooth it. And now we're going to have to cut overlaps. And so where the piece overlaps, you're going to cut at an angle through both pieces. And then slip and score them, and then you're going to press them together. If you get a little divot in there, which can happen sometimes, just take a little bit of clay, roll a tiny, tiny coil, and right now put it in and just smooth it out. And that takes care of it. But if you have problems with little divots or depressions where your little overlaps happen, it's easy to take care of. And then we'll just smooth this with the sponge. Pinch it, how we pinch it and we kind of come around. You wear a mask when you're working with anything that can be dusty. I, I always recommend you err on the side of caution. I definitely don't want anybody exposing themselves to anything, you know. I have been doing this for over 20 years. I do wear my mask when I make clay, when I make glaze, when I grind shelves, when I sand anything, when I spray on glaze, anything that can stir up dust. Some, you know, I only wet clean my studio, so I don't stir up dust when I'm doing that. That is a huge thing. Um, you know, I know some people who sweep their studio. Never sweep in your studio, ever. It's not safe. Don't sweep. Don't vacuum. Unless you have a Dust Cobra vacuum or another company's vacuum that's specifically made to vacuum up clay dust. And there's not all that many that are. So just take care of yourself because you want to do this for a long time, right? We all want to do this for another like 50 years. I do. I want to do this 50 more years. That's on my plan. That's what's in my agenda. So I didn't have to make a little coil for any of them except this one here. That one was the one that I made that one for. And then I don't somehow in the time that I just used that red rib, like five minutes ago, I've managed to misplace it. But usually I'll use that to smooth my foot ring down nice and even. And then damp sponge and give it a nice going over to round over the edges. I don't want sharp edges on my feet. Yeah, that's not the one. <laughs> that's my, that's not the one. Um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes we'll be doing a broadcast and you guys will tell me where my stuff is because I misplace it. But um, it's fun when I'm filming classes and then I can't find it because I got nobody to tell me. And I'm like, help, where'd I put this thing? 
piece of decal is just sticking to me. So I'm going to use the side of my finger to smooth this edge. You know, another thing I really like to do for that is if you have a color shaper, you can also use a craft brush. This is a, a color shaper or a craft shaper. You could use the end of a rounded paintbrush. Some people use um, bamboo skewers. Some people use chopsticks. There's so many things you can use to seal that little seam. All right, now we're ready to go ahead and I'm gonna take this and before I put it on, I'm gonna do my overlap. I'm gonna cut through both. Normally I would not cut on top of the platter, just I wanna make sure you all can see it. And then now we're going to line this up and we're just going to eyeball it. And what I want to do is mimic the shape of the outer foot ring. And then using something, I'm going to trace the outside and the inside line. So I make a little racetrack right there. And then using my slip, I'm going to slip and score inside there. And the slip I'm using is actually made with magic water, which is soda ash, soda ash and sodium silicate and just water. And I have a recipe for that. It's um, really, really easy to make. And that's what I use for joining and it helps prevent cracking and you get better joins. Maybe it's on the floor. Everybody's trying to figure out where I put my rib. Yeah, and so the foot maker is a modified corn on the cob holder. I have a free tutorial. It's on ClayShare. It's on my YouTube channel. It's easy to make. I mean, you probably don't even need a tutorial, but hey, it's fun watching me struggle with power tools because, you know, power tools are not my thing. I'm a potter. And using power tools are always <laughs> an adventure. All right, so now we're going to smooth this out, the inside and the outside. And I can see I, I've got a little area I want to fill in here, right here. Maybe it'll fill in itself. Let's see. As we smooth it out, looks like it's going to fill itself in so I don't have to do it. I don't worry about these being perfect. This is not a commercially made piece. This is handmade and I eyed the shape. I just eyeballed it. So we're not going to stress about those things. It gives it charm and character. And then, you know, 30 years down the line, your grandkids are serving their holiday meal off the platter you made. And they'll be like, look at that. Graham made that. And that's her hand. That's, you know, left behind. That's an echo of her hand. That's pretty cool, right? All right, so this needs to sit, and I usually cover it with plastic and let it sit overnight. If I make it late in the day, it's late in the day for me here, but if I was making this in the morning, I would just let it sit out until about 2 or 3 in the afternoon, you know, about 4 to 6 hours, and then you can flip it over. But we can't flip this over right now. It'll sag. So what we'll do is we'll pretend we flipped it over, and we'll pull out the one that is over here. All right, so once you flip it over, you're gonna wanna go in and just with your finger or with your sponge, smooth your edges. You know, you don't want any rough edges. And then you get to make a decision. You know, if you want to go ahead and add an underglaze to the rim and paint along this rim right now, you could do that. I might do it. I'm gonna actually wait. I'm actually thinking I'm gonna do gold luster on the rim of this and then a few little gold dots here and there, so I'm not gonna do the underglaze on it. Because I wiped this clean with a sponge, I wouldn't be worried at all about cornstarch being a problem if I wanted to do that to the rim, just so everybody knows if they were concerned about that, because there's no cornstarch um, on that edge. Now, it does look dusty and faded, and that's because the cornstarch is still on it, and that's normal. Until you bisque fire it, it's gonna look that way. So for drying, you know, you'll turn it over, and then you're gonna let it set probably another day covered. And then what you're gonna wanna use is some weight bags. 
um, and you're going to weigh it down until it's bone dry. This piece is bone dry. So I have, I'm going to put my weight bag away. Yes, I did. All right, let me grab one. So, you know, again, I have a tutorial on making weight bags, but it's just so easy. Take an old sock, fill it with some cat litter or rice or beans or whatever, whatever you've got. I've used wood pellets from my pellet stove to make weight bags because I was out of the other things. And what I do is, now you make sure this is dry enough so it won't sag when you put the weight bag on. And you do the whole thing. So you're gonna cover the whole thing with weight bags. And like this was the old sleeve of a long sleeve shirt. This was as well, this was actually the square in the center of the shirt. After you cut the sleeves off, take the front and back and you just put your whatever material in the middle, gather up your edges, use a rubber band. These are all no sew folks. I don't, I don't sew my weight bags, although you could. Um, rubber band, just tied, just tied knots in the ends with these. This one is about 15 years old. <laughs> That's how old that, that, that weight bag is. But they keep working forever and ever, so. You forgot to put a center foot on your first large plate. Can you put a cookie or something under it when you bisque fire for support? Yes, you can, and And you're gonna wanna put a cookie on when you glaze fire as well. And so a cookie is just a little piece of either kiln shelf. You can make one from clay and cut it out. It's called a cookie, because usually it's a you know, circle shape. And you can use that, but I would make sure for the one you use in the glaze fire, it's been bisqued. Don't use a raw clay cookie. Use a bisque cookie. All right, so that's what you do. And then when it's dry, you uh, take it and you bisque fire it. Now we're gonna make the Christmas tree dish. So let me put this over here and get more clay. All my clay is over here. All right, I'm gonna take my cutter and I'm gonna take my knife and go get the clay because I don't wanna cut more than I need, but I wanna cut enough. So, usually I'll roll out a slab of clay in the morning and usually another one at lunchtime when I'm working. All right, so I made my bags out of kitty litter and sometimes the kitty litter comes out and gets on everything. Oftentimes the kitty litter does not burn out um, and will leave little specks in your clay. So if you wanted to make your own speckled clay, you could do it with kitty litter. Um, not sure if you want to, but you could. So can you add gold luster after it's bisque or you have to do a final firing with it? Yeah, so the way gold luster works is it's an overglaze enamel. It fires to a very low temperature, 018. So Anything higher than that, it will burn out, and it has to go on top of a glaze. So you need to bisque fire this, glaze fire it, then you can put your gold luster on and fire it a third time. It's a three fire process if you're gonna go ahead and do luster, which I've done in Clay Share Con. We did tutorials on luster, which you, know, you guys can go watch that for free. Clay Share Con 2022 is coming up in February. We'll have a bunch more tutorials. We got people already signing up to do demos for us. And um, I don't know, maybe I'll talk about luster again. Everybody wants to know. There are always a lot of luster questions. Also, my premium members of ClayShare, I have a few tutorials on there using luster. So if you want to know, you can go watch. All right, gonna take this, did both sides, same B mix clay. We're gonna use that sweater one that everybody was talking about that has a hole in it. You only need half of this, which is good because half of mine has a hole in it. So it's handy that I'm only gonna use half. So I'm just gonna cut it right down the center. Make sure I don't use the half with the, the hole in it. <laughs> All right. So we're good to go. We're gonna lay this on. Something like this, this decal here, I think would really be difficult to do on bisque wear. I don't think you'd get a good transfer with it. So if you're thinking about trying it on bisque wear, I would suggest no. 
Um, I would suggest not. All right, so we got this on, and I can feel how thick this is. You made weight bags with sand, and the sand starts to seep too. Yeah, so you know what you can do? Um, I've had some folks who will actually put the sand in a plastic bag and then put the plastic bag inside their cloth because the cloth keeps it from sticking, right? So you can do it that way if you have to, and it works. Nick, you're here. Hi. What did you miss? Everything. We made all the stuff. We made a big platter. Now we're going to make a Christmas tree dish. So this one's going to take a little while. We're going to just let it smooth, and I'm probably going to have to do quite a bit with water to get it to transfer. And I, I have done smaller things with this underglaze decal. I've done ornaments with it really successfully. Here's one on a speckled clay that's been bisque fired. I just got to clear glaze it. But you can see it's a perfect transfer. We didn't lose any of the color. It's all there. It's, it's going through pretty good, actually. I, can, I see a color change already. You've been using Amico Velvet Underglazes and was not able to find it anymore. You ordered Speedball now. Can you mix the two brands? You can. You can mix them. Their colors are slightly different from each other, but they blend. Speedball and Amico both make um, their products so they can actually mix. You'll get a new color if you mix them together. So it's like, woo, that's exciting. So I got a little area here that still needs to transfer. Now speaking of transfers, you can make your own. And I, I you know, got a class on that. I've got another one I want to put out that I did for the, a conference last year that I filmed that I should put out for you all. All right. I feel like this one transferred really well. You tried out the sweater and it didn't work for you, Connie. Well, hopefully this will help you and you'll, you'll see. Um, hopefully it'll work for me. Got folks watching. Oh, I see a grease. Uh, you missed the beginning, but you know what? You can catch the, um, the rest of it. Uh, see, uh, oh, did I get my big kiln hooked up? Not yet. We've not had any more time. Kevin worked on it a whole day, and uh, um, we had some issues with getting it level. The place where it's going is not level, so we still got to work on it, but we haven't had, a, had the time. All right, not quite, because I can see, but it's almost... All right, let's do a peek. I want a peek. Use rice and beans, not cooked, of course. Yeah, they work great. Oh, I don't know. I think, see, there it wasn't, it didn't transfer well there, but, and this is the kind of thing, you don't want to take any chances because a bare spot on this is going to very much show. Although, I mean, you can go in with underglaze and touch it up. It looks good. I think we're good. Yeah. So we got a nice, good transfer. A little, um, could have waited a little longer on the bottom. I could have pounced it a little more, but that's okay. I don't think that's not even going to be in the dish. So again, cornstarch. And I don't know if the camera is picking it up. Maybe I'll. Maybe I'll adjust this. Can you see how shiny this is? I don't know if maybe I can. Just lost who knows what. <laughs> can you see the shine? OK, anyhow, point being, it's, you'll see it in person. It's shiny. And then if I touch it right now, I'll smear it. And I don't want to do that. So we're going to put the cornstarch down. And I have found, I have a better brush for this. A pouncing type brush is better than a sweeping brush. So just do it m more pouncy. This one is, uh, I would say, juicier than the other one we did. 
think I gotta. Yeah, I got a pound. I got a pouncier brush. Here we go. This fan brush is pouncier. Ladies, if you have any old blush brushes, loose powder brushes, that's what you want for this. So if you pick some cheap ones up the next time you're at the like drugstore or a store that sells them, you know, just take them to the studio. Which potter's wheel is best to start with? Still good for you to throw. So it depends on, there's a lot of good ones. Actually, I wrote a blog post about it on claysharesources.com. And you can read, uh, I did a review on a whole bunch of them. I do have two Bailey Pro wheels that I love. And when I bought my first wheel, that was the wheel I went with. And I'm still using my first one 20 years later. And the other one's 17 years old. And then I have an Artista Speedball tabletop, which is really great, but if you're going to get heavy into throwing, you might possibly outgrow it. Just depends what you plan to do. All right, so <laughs> cornstarch is fine. It's not going to hurt you, um, and, it, and it burns out. All right, ready? Going to make our cut. A fine mesh tea diffuser. Oh, yeah, and just kind of shake it on. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea, too. I love that. If your kiln isn't level, um, so it, it, it's just ideal to have your kiln level when it's firing, you know, just because as you're stacking things, if you have something unlevel, you could, um, you know, you have things at an angle and pressure and weight and, you know, it's just not good. But it's easy to level it, just use a level. And as you're putting it on gravel, make sure it's level, the kiln stand is level. And then when you put the actual kiln, on, um, make sure that's leveled. Kevin did it by himself. I wasn't here to help him. It's really hard to do it by yourself. So if you have an unlevel surface that needs to be leveled, I should specify. All right, put this up there. Now we've got our dish. I'm just gonna turn it over. All right, I'm good. Now let me find where I put my treat. There's my treat. So we're going to sit this on, see if that's big enough, a board, because we're going to flip it. And I'm going to worry about cleaning up edges after. I'm not going to worry about that now, after it's leather hard. So you're going to sit this on here. And the cutter is made so that you get a nice, like, good three quarters of an inch to almost an inch of space around the edge here. So. You get a nice rim. Not too big of a rim, but like a good sized rim. And then I'm gonna take this board. And I'm gonna put it on an angle. And then we're gonna flip it over. Has anybody used Duncan Pure Brilliance Glaze? Uh, Diana, when I do low fire things, yes, I've used their Pure Brilliance Clear. I've also used their Satin, um, which is a gorgeous satin glaze for low fire. The whole thing shifted. Don't worry. The slab didn't shift. The whole thing did. So I'm just going to press this down. And I think for this one, we're just going to use our sponge. And you're going to press this in because you have all these bumpy shapes. So it's going to work best to press to start with. And then go up your sides. And then if you want to use your finger, you just kind of drag it along. Now you don't have to put a foot on this if you don't want to. It's the kind of thing that doesn't have to have one, but I'm gonna show you a way that I do it. How are we on time? We got five more minutes. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. And then uh, gotta go. So in prime time this week, 
Next, we're going to be making a fairy house, and I've got one off to the side here done that you all can see. All right, so now we'll just turn this like that, and um, it's going to be pretty awesome. <laughs> and it's kind of taken over my life lately. I've been making, I've been making so many fairy houses lately. Uh, I can't even talk about it. It's kind of crazy. I think I dropped my foot maker, so I'm going to show you. If you don't have a foot maker, what you can do. Um, you can go to the hardware store and get these strips of wood and they'll be sold in the, with the dowels and everything and you just don't get a nice taper that you get with a foot maker but you just put this on your slab and you cut your strip and you get a nice even strip of clay. So this right here, we get one, you can kind of see what I'm doing, right? You get it? where it's going. I'm going to the widest points here. Need to cut another strip. So if you're watching this and you don't have a corn cob holder and you're thinking, oh, there's no way I can do that, just use a dowel, a little thickness strip. And then we need a tiny bit here, right, for that point. So you want to put it on the widest areas. And then we'll just flip them up. Yes, there is underglaze decal on that, but that's okay. Won't hurt anything. We'll just start at the top. Put one on. And just work our, our way down. And this will be fine. The underglaze decal on here won't hurt it at all as far as the joining. Now this one is on the floor. I think that's where, I think that's the thing that fell. Susan, you're totally right. <laughs> The thing that fell, that would have been, yeah, that's okay. You know, it's always good to have a backup plan because you never know what's going to happen. You know, I've gone and taught workshops and got to the workshops and, you know, realized I forgot one of the things I needed and, you know, you have to improvise. So this one's got a curve to it. The others don't. Eh. You can curve them all if you want to. I think on mine, they have a slight curve. How they all have a little bit of a curve on the back of that done one. So again, just like the big platter, this is going to have to sit for about three, four hours uncovered or overnight covered with plastic. And then we can take you can flip it out of the mold of the mold that it's in. Little underglaze decal right there. We'll just wipe that off. Let me show you a cool way to finish the edge. So if you have little dowels, these are great because you can take them and you can just rub them up against it and it creates this nice inward curve. and finishes it off and then you can blend them in and then once this is leather hard you know you can go back in and blend it a little more I had plans to make like a whole bunch of dishes I have all these platter forms and dish forms back here I was like oh we're gonna make like eight dishes two two dishes later story of my life I'm always like we'll do it all and then reality is there's only so many minutes in an hour. So I just want to make sure I have really hugging that shape. There. 
Why doesn't it slump around the gaps in the foot like it would on cookies? That's not enough of a space. So, and it wouldn't do it on a cookie well. <laughs> it might do it on a cookie if the cookie wasn't big enough. But it works because our spacing is small enough. I've supported the widest parts, so the most of it is supported. And it, um, it'll work. I know. It's like it's physics. It's crazy. All right, and so the rest of this right here, um, you know, again, this gets wedged up and it's going to end up going to make molds, which I'm always needing to make more molds or stamps or sprigs or something, right? Could you take it off now? If we take it off now, it will probably slump because the clay is wet. We just rolled this slat out. So I would not take it off now. It has to sit. That's just how these forms work, and the forms are made of a, a wood product, so they will help it dry faster and wick some of the moisture out of it, which is great. But if you take it off now, it totally will slump. You're going to make mini bakers with your new old slab roller. Woohoo! That's exciting. Jewelry pieces from scratch, you totally could. Yep, and I just wedged mine up, and I could have saved that. <laughs> well, you know, next time, right? All right, let me show you all the fairy house we're going to make as a little sneak peek for those, my premium members. Um, this tutorial we just did will be available up on the ClayShare app and on ClayShare.com. You can watch it for free forever and ever. Learn to make holiday platters or just regular platters or just use under glazed decals. It's a really handy thing. Um, you know, when you go to glaze and fire these, I'll just quickly talk about that. You want to use a zinc-free glaze. Zinc can react to your underglaze. It can sometimes erode it or eat it away or change the color and, or craze, which is pulling away from it. So you can get some really bad results. Also, if you glaze it too thickly, you can get pulling away. So you need to do a little thinner glazing and use a zinc free. I'm going to be using zinc free clear on both of these. I'm going to be using Speedball's stoneware glaze. It's a cone 5-6 glaze that is zinc free. Although it doesn't say it's zinc free on the package, it actually is. I have confirmation from Speedball as many other people have asked Speedball and gotten the same answer. So, And I've been using it. So, Peak. Here's the peak. There you go. All right. So here it is. Cute little fairy house. It's a it's a lidded jar. Woo! Look at that fairy house. You could actually turn it into a luminary, and we'll talk about that next. So we're going to make this together in our make along tutorial, and that's happening at six fifteen. So that's what that's what I got going down, everybody. Candy, right? Uh, just what I said. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Michael Klein, how are you doing? Jumping on at the end. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving and you're going to have a good Christmas. So your studio put a platter of yours that had a foot on it on cookies and it warped like crazy. So you don't need to put it on cookies if it has a foot on it because the foot is the piece that supports it. It does the job of cookies. The problem with cookies is they're supporting a wide expanse on one little tiny area and it ends up holding that area up and the rest slumps around it. So you don't need cookies if you have feet on it because that's why we put feet on. So we don't need cookies. But, and ironic that I said I want to do it all. You remember wanting to do it all at the workshop. <laughs> yeah, I know. We tried to do it all at the workshop. There's never enough time. All right, so that's what we got going this week. Uh, and I'll be making the fairy houses and uh, that's it. Any last questions before I go? Hey from the Isle of Man, and I'll say bye from the Isle of Man too. So the Fairy House tutorial is going to be available for premium members of ClayShare. That will be on ClayShare.com or on the ClayShare app. If you are a member, you can watch it. But it's one of our premium classes, our premium tutorials. So, you know, we have a free seven-day trial. You can sign up and check it out. Uh, membership is only $9.99 a month or $9.99 a year. And we have hundreds, almost 400 full-length pottery classes two private broadcasts each week just for premium members and then we have the public broadcast so I do three live broadcasts sponsorship offers giveaways all kinds of great things and oh yeah premium members get discounts on my rolling pins okay that's enough selling all right everyone 
We're going to make more pots in a minute. You take care. Have a great week, and I'll see you all next Wednesday. Bye, everybody.